are hurt, she can tell me. If he's really sorry, he'll apologize. How can she not know that her words are so hurtful? He needs to apologize. He must know that what he said is offensive. He's intentionally keeping quiet just to irritate me. Why, Why are, are you, you so hard, hard to, to get, get along, along with? with? <laughs> All right, that, that was our talk. Well, that was a quick talk. <laughs> so, in case you didn't know, that's called a conflict. <laughs> so, when we're in the middle of conflict, what is our perspective supposed to be? T today we're going to look at quite a few verses that give us guidance about how to resolve conflict. And you know, God's words are not just passive words on a page. Hebrews 4, verse 12, tells us that God's words are living and active. They're intended to become a central part of our lives. And as we'll talk about today, many of God's words are so practical. So the first verse, as Isaac read, is Romans 12, 17, and 18. So do not repay anyone evil for evil, but be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Actually, we would encourage you to read the whole chapter of Romans 12 through the lens of thinking about conflict resolution. It's a completely different perspective from our fleshly view. We often think about conflict as competition. There's a winner and there's a loser, and we want to be the winner. Or we think about conflict as a kind of a debt or obligation. She owes me an apology, or I don't owe you an apology. You deserve everything I said, and worse. However, we don't find this kind of thinking in Romans 12. So we're going to break these verses down a little bit. So do not repay anyone evil for evil. So revenge is not an option? Yeah. Doing evil in response to having suffered evil is never justified in God's sight. There's a very common phenomenon that hurt people hurt people. This is a play on words, obviously. But the point is that if we are hurt, we have a natural tendency to deal with the hurt by hurting another person. This principle doesn't only pertain to our moment of conflict, but also those of us who have had significant hurt or trauma from the past might have more of a tendency to hurt those we love. Perhaps there's unresolved pain from your childhood or teen years toward a person who's no longer part of your life. Or it's someone who continues to be a part of your life, but for various reasons, you haven't been able to work through the pain. Yet regardless of whether we are reacting in response to present conflict or past hurts, we all need to apply the same principles in order to resolve conflict so that we can experience more closeness and more authenticity in our love relationships. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. It's not enough for me to justify my behavior. She's on her high horse again. She deserves to be taken down a notch or two. The verse says, be careful to do what's right in the eyes of everyone. For me, to do what's right in my eyes is a very low bar to clear. If I'm angry, I can justify all kinds of words and behaviors. When we're in conflict, sometimes we tend to rate behaviors. If she calls me a lazy bum, I think that's like a six. 
So if I give her the silent treatment until tomorrow morning, that's only a four. <laughs> or if I say something rude, I think that's like a 4.5. So I still maintain the moral high ground, right? <laughs> um, no. <laughs> God is saying to us here, did we lose the PowerPoint? We did. Okay. So as we read before, God says, be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. So we need to be careful about what we do. Although we are not responsible for the other person's choice, we are completely responsible for our choice, right? In fact, we should remind ourselves regularly that my response is my responsibility. So I can't justify my behavior based on someone else's behavior. That's the message of Romans 12, 17. And if I'm going to take Romans 12, 17 at its word, I have no excuse to be vindictive or to sin against others who have hurt me. Now, oh, we got it back. Now let's look at um, the next verse. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, Live at peace with everyone, hmm, if it is possible. It doesn't say if you feel like it or if you're in the mood. It says if it is possible. So if we can open our mouth and say harsh words, well, then it is possible for us to open our mouth and say kind words. As far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Now, this is both a challenge and a relief. As far as it depends on me means I need to do everything in my power to bring about peace. That means there's no excuse for me to give up. There's no situation in which I'm supposed to stop bringing peace. That's the challenge part. What's the relief part? Well, I'm only responsible for me. Am I doing everything I can to live at peace with this person? Well, there's probably one or two more things I could do, but I'm not responsible for the result. The scripture here is very realistic. There's a lot I can do to have more peace with my spouse or my kids or my coworkers, but I'm not responsible for the other person's choices. If you're going to be bitter and carry a grudge, that's your decision. I can do my part to bring restoration, but I can't do your part. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. So now we've established this godly perspective on conflict. Revenge and other types of hurtful behavior are off the table, and I'm fully responsible to pursue peace. So now what? She's just said something that irritates me. I'm in this situation where everything that feels natural to say or do has just been removed from me as an option. I'd like to call her, uh, can't say that, I want to bring up my favorite, you always, no, I can't do that. Maybe I'll just shut my mouth and fume in silent bitterness. No, I'm not supposed to do that. So it feels like we've cleaned out our toolbox of all the sinful communication tools, and now we have an empty toolbox. So are we stuck? No, we are not stuck and without tools to resolve conflict. Are you disagreeing with me? <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. Fortunately, <laughs> there's a lot more about resolving conflict that we're going to look at in God's word. But first, um, Jonathan's going to share about a diagram that he came up with while we were preparing the talk. In order to deal with conflict effectively, we need rules. We could think of conflict as a kind of game that we play, maybe not a very pleasant game. 
Now, when we have a game, there have to be rules. And before you talk about the rules, you identify what is the game that you are engaged in. And what does it mean to win? What does it mean to lose? And we usually think about conflict like, like this. It's you against me. And I am against you. And eventually, one of us is a winner and one of us is a loser. And often, even if we are the so-called winner, we may still feel miserable. So, and if we win, so what are you gonna do with all that prize money you just won from arguing with your spouse? And if the conflict isn't resolved, then we're still in this opposition. And this opposition model of conflict seems to be in disagreement with God's word that we see in these verses and some other verses we're gonna look at. And fortunately, we're not limited to one model. What if you and I are on the same team and together we're opposing the conflict? That might look kind of like this. And I think it's even better if we conceptualize it like this. It shows that we are together and we're no longer competing against each other. If you lose, that doesn't mean that I win. We're in it together. And sometimes our views might be incompatible or our opinions. And this uh, perspective of teamwork was very helpful for Wendy and me when we were first married because sometimes we weren't able to respond to come to uh, agreement. And one of us would say, are we still on the same team? Just as a reminder that we can be together without necessarily agreeing about everything. So we're gonna take a look at a number of verses from both the Old Testament and New Testament that give us guidance about how to resolve conflict. So Jonathan and I decided to call these resolution rules. Or is it resolution rules? Oh. It's kind of a play on oh, words. Sorry. I don't know if the, yeah, yeah. okay, the yes. graphics come up there, so. Okay. Yes, because resolution is, is what we want. It's the goal. And uh, there's an there's a outline in your bulletin, and Angela's passing out some more outlines. If you need a pen or an outline, you can just uh, raise your hand, and she'll get that to you. So we can benefit from taking God's word and applying it to our own cases of conflict. To help us remember these resolution rules, I like mnemonics, so I came up with a mnemonic of own cases, and uh, there's an, the outline in your bulletin there uh, has the own cases mnemonic. I, I was there. Okay. Sorry. Okay, but first, um, I want to clarify that these principles that we're talking about are for situations that don't involve abuse. If there's an abusive situation happening, you might need a different set of rules. And it's very important to know that God doesn't want anyone to be abused. In an abusive situation, there may need to be, um, you might not even have contact with that person until they've done you know, A, B, and C. Um, certain factors that need to happen depending on the situation. So uh, for these situations, it's a good idea to work with either a trusted friend or a counselor, but to have someone else involved. And actually, I want to take a moment to emphasize this point a little more because too often, Christians have the distorted belief that being a Christian means being silent and not opposing things that are happening. Yet, we should realize that abuse is a kind of evil. And if a person is being abusive, and if we fail to put parameters around the abuse, we end up enabling evil. And enabling evil is against God's will. So it isn't good for the abused person, obviously, but it's not also, it's not good for the abuser 
because the abuser becomes desensitized to his or her behavior. It's obvious that abuse is not good for the victim of the abuse, but it's also the case that it's not good for the abuser. So let's get started with own cases. Okay, O is four, one at a time. So when we're in conflict, we actually need to take turns speaking. Proverbs 10, 19 tells us, when there are many words, wrongdoing is unavoidable, but one who restrains his lips is wise. So the application of this verse can be particularly challenging if one or both people have a tendency to dominate the conversation. Well, for this situation, it's good to use a one-minute timer. Okay. The way it works is, if I interrupt Jonathan when he's talking, which admittedly, amid my Italian heritage, this happens a lot, <laughs> but if we've resorted to using a timer to resolve conflict and I interrupt him, then he gets to restart the time which rightly gives him an additional minute. Right? So for situations where one person is more talkative than the, and the other is more quiet, this creates an opportunity for the quiet and less outspoken person to have more time to talk while keeping the talkative person in check. Okay, wait. Why should we do this? After all, entering into an argument feels like a competition, right? And those of us who are competitive like to win. I grew up in a um, rather competitive family. Uh, we had six kids. We were all just one year apart. My mom had six kids by the time she was 26 years old. So we got lots of practice arguing, lots. In fact, I think it's part of what helped my attorney sister become a federal judge in the US. She had lots of practice. So yet, as my sister knows too, in our family relationships, it doesn't, the, the approach to conflict is not like an adversarial courtroom. Our goal needs to be a peaceful resolution, not just showing the other person that they are wrong and we are right. Oftentimes, both people, both of us have done wrong and each person needs to hear what he or she did wrong. Sometimes, neither person is wrong, but there is a difference of an opinion or there's one of three misses. So what are these three misses? Well, a misunderstanding, a misperception, miscommunication. When we are experiencing conflict, it's helpful to evaluate the situation and try to identify if one of three, these three misses are part of the conflict. They often are. So, and you know, when we're taking turns speaking, it helps each person to feel like their words are important and that they've been listened to. This, in and of itself, can help to bring greater peace during that time of conflict. Another verse that goes with this concept is James 1, 19 and 20. My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry, because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. If I'm talking, I'm not listening. It's like teachers tell students, God gave you two ears and one mouth for a reason. So here it is. We are to be quick. We are to rush to listen. And then we consider our words before we speak. Are we speaking angry, hurtful words? Then we need to consider our words again. Notice in these verses that listening is a higher priority than speaking. We often think about resolving our conflicts in terms of what we want to say. 
we might be going through our day thinking about all the zingers we're ready to launch at the person we have conflict with. But we should be thinking, wow, I can't wait to see this person so I can hear what she wants to say. So that's O, one at a time. Take turns expressing yourselves. Use a one minute timer if needed. Just don't spend your silent minute focusing on the clock. Okay, so W. W is don't walk out. Some of you might be thinking, what's so bad about walking out? After all, if your feelings have just been hurt, you don't want to risk continuing to be hurt. Now, something really important about this point to clarify is if violence is, in, is involved, don't just walk out, run out, right? And don't hesitate to call the police if needed. And I know that you know, this is a complicated situation and there's not time to say more about it now, but in short, such acts, actions here will prevent enabling a person to do wrong, which isn't good for you and it's not good for them either. So another reason why it might be reasonable to walk out is that we're afraid that we might say or do something we're not supposed to do. So, okay, well, if we need some time and space to think before re-engaging with the other person, that's okay, but first, we need to communicate about this need. So tell the other person you need some time and space to think about it. But something else that's very important is to communicate about when you will be ready to talk about it again. Right. It's a mistake to not go back and talk about it. Many people might think, oh, we'll feel, we'll feel better in the morning. Yet, too often, it registers with the person emotionally and can eventually become a root of bitterness. This is why the next verse talks about not going to bed while we're still angry. So um, a verse that goes with this is Ecclesiastes 3.1. There is a time for everything and a season for every activity under the heavens. So the point is there's a time to talk and a time to wait to talk, but we should always make sure that we talk through the conflict. Since the, since the temptation to walk out as well as other temptations we experience usually involve anger, we're going to look at a couple more verses about anger. Ephesians 4, 26 and 27. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry, and do not give the devil a foothold. Notice that these verses don't say, don't be angry. It's assumed that we will be angry at times. It's not a sin to be angry. The issue is what we do with that anger. I think a lot of times we confuse anger and rage. Anger is an emotion. All of our emotions were created by God. The anger emotion is like the physical feeling of pain. It lets us know that something is wrong. And there are many verses in the Bible that talk about God's anger in different situations. On the other hand, rage is an out of control expression of anger. Ephesians 4.26 here says, in your anger, do not sin. This tells us that it is possible to be angry but not be sinning, to not be rageful in our anger. Did you know that there are constructive ways to express anger? One that came to my mind uh, when I was a boy, one of my friends, one of my neighbors, had an older brother who died when he was hit by a drunk driver. And one of the things that she did with her pain was she started a Students Against Drunk Driving group in our high school. Okay, so the N is for no name calling. <sighs> you know, attacking the other person by calling them names might feel good at the time, 
but it makes the situation worse. It creates more anger and more distrust. And this actually moves us further away from resolving conflict and instead only adds to the conflict. So in Ephesians 4.29, we're told, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. Now to clarify, this doesn't mean that we only say positive things, right? Not everything in our communication is rainbows and unicorns, right? Sometimes we need to hear things that identify what we've done that's hurtful to another person so that we can be a better, more sensitive person. Remain calm. Not being calm escalates the situation even more. Proverbs 15.1 reminds us, a gentle answer deflects anger, but harsh words make tempers flare. When we are calm, we are less likely to say something that we regret. So another point about this is that our anger can very easily keep us from being calm. And the reason for that, as you can see um, in the graphic here, um, in neuroscience research, they do functional MRIs, which bears evidence of this dynamic. When we're angry, the part of our brain called the amygdala, that's a, in the temporal lobe of our brain, gets ignited, right? But when, when that's getting ignited, the other part of our brain, behind our forehead here, our prefrontal cortex, where we think, reason, logic, make judgments, the activity here goes down. Whew. This is a bad combination, right? This is a bad combination. Well, that's why when we're angry, we are so at risk of saying something or doing something that we'll regret because essentially we're kind of behaving more like an animal and less like a human in those situations. So we need to be aware that anger can physiologically predis predispose us to say something or do something in the moment of anger that we'll regret later. So this is one more reason for us to work at remaining calm when we're engaged in conflict. Avoid accusations. Ephesians 4.15 very succinctly tells us, speak the truth in love. Accusations can lead others to focus on defending themselves rather than listening and seeking to understand you. Instead, identify and talk about the emotions that you feel because it's harder for someone else to argue about how you feel. On the other hand, it's very natural for someone to become defensive when they feel attacked. It can be more effective to talk about how the other person's actions made you feel. So something that will help us to talk about our feelings without coming across in an attacking or accusatory way is to use I statements. And the tracks that we can run on with I statements, you know how in science you have hypothesis, so this is a kind of similar thing. This is when you do blank, I feel blank. So Jonathan and I are gonna give some examples of this. Honey, when you don't help with the housework, I feel overwhelmed. Thanks for telling everybody. <laughs> When you look at your phone during dinner, I feel unimportant. When we don't get to spend time together, I feel alone. So communicating this way helps us to avoid conflict over how a particular offense happens. Not getting distracted with this can make it easier for the offending person to listen to how his or her actions affect the other person. So let's take a closer look at um, Ephesians 4.15. And we can see that there's two parts 
to this verse, right? One is speaking truth, and the other is speaking in an attitude of love. Most of us have a tendency to struggle with one of these and find it difficult to do both parts. If we're someone who's not afraid of confrontation, we might find it easy to speak truth, but our attitude may not be so loving. On the other hand, if we're afraid of confrontation, we might find it easier to come across as loving and sort of sugarcoating things, but not speak words of truth. Sometimes I refer to this as supportive lying. Right? Be specific. The meaning of this is we want to identify behaviors that are upsetting you rather than attacking someone's character. So focusing on behaviors and actions, but not character and intentions. All of us know what it's like to be misunderstood. Let's not assume that we can analyze the other person's motives. A verse from the Bible that can encourage us in this direction is Matthew 18, 15. If your brother or sister sins against you, go and point out their fault just between the two of you. If they listen to you, you have won them over. Notice in this verse, first we identify that someone has wronged us. And then we identify the specific action that was hurtful. And if we take this verse together with the next verse, we can see that Jesus is saying something here that is, again, relevant to abusive situations. The next verse says, But if they will not listen, take one or two others along, so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. So first we have the experience where we feel we've been sinned against. Then we have the step where we identify what it is that was done that was offensive. Go and point out their fault just between the two of you. This is an example of us doing what's in our power to live at peace with the other person. Then it's up to the other person to respond. Maybe he or she will respond positively. If they listen to you, you've won them over. In that case, peace has been restored. However, maybe the offender won't admit to doing anything wrong and will continue to offend. This passage addresses that possibility. But if they will not listen, take one or two others along so that every matter may be established by a testimony of two or three witnesses. This is where we might involve a counselor or a trusted friend to help us work through the conflict. If we take these two verses together with Romans 12, 17, and 18, we can see that God is not calling us to stay in an abusive situation. We're called to do our part to bring about peace. However, if we are doing our part and the other party is still abusive, then there isn't peace, and we may need to get some help to bring about resolution. Okay, so E is for don't exaggerate. Now, one specific thing that will help us not to exaggerate is for us to avoid using the phrases, you always, or, or you never. Right? In the context of conflict resolution, these words are not helpful and only serve to escalate the tension. So basically, when we use these words, it's usually a lie. So Jonathan's going to share two verses with us that can help reinforce this principle. Ephesians 4.25, so stop telling lies. Let us tell our neighbors the truth, for we are all parts of the same body. And from Exodus, you must not testify falsely against your neighbor. Okay, and the last letter S is for don't stockpile. When we're trying to resolve conflict about something, it's not helpful to bring up stuff from the past. It, in fact, it's almost impossible to deal with numerous old problems at the same time as you're trying to deal with the issue at hand. Another problem with this is that each person's perceptions about the old problems might differ, and this moves us even farther away 
from resolving our conflict in the moment. So Proverbs 29, 11 says, fools vent their anger, but the wise quietly hold it back. If each person vents all of their complaints, there won't be time to resolve the conflict. So we need to try to deal with problems as they arise. Don't introduce topics until each one is fully discussed. And note that what's being held back is the anger, not the issue of conflict, right? If we have issues of conflict in close relationships, they need to be discussed. And discuss, discussing these issues of conflict and disagreement, when it's done the right way, it actually is something that can help us feel more closeness and authenticity in our relationship. So the last verse we're going to take a look at is um, Ephesians 4.32. Forgive one another just as God through Christ has forgiven you. So storing up grievances and hurt feelings over time is definitely counterproductive. And one thing that makes forgiveness difficult is that people feel like, people often get this confused. They feel like they can't forgive until they stop hurting. Yet the reality is we can forgive and still hurt from the offense. There are some offenses that leave us hurting for years, maybe even decades, but it doesn't mean that we can't forgive. We need to delineate between forgiveness and trust. We can forgive someone, but that doesn't mean that we trust them. So there, there's two different, two different issues. Forgiveness is a decision, and trust takes time. So in addition, with forgiveness and trust, it's important for us to keep, be mindful that forgiveness is past-oriented. Trust is either present and future-oriented. One of my favorite quotes is, bitterness is the cup of poison that we drink while we wait for the other person to die. So, um, and there's, uh, if we have more time, uh, we could talk about this, but there's additional research out today that correlates forgiveness and increased immunity, correlates bitterness and resentment with a higher risk of cancer. Um, so one last quick point is I wanted to comment on, uh, I said something about abuse before, also um, addiction. With addiction and conflict resolution, is that addiction can really complicate conflict resolution. And uh, we can be addicted to all kinds of things, right? It's not just you know, drugs or alcohol. You know, a person can be addicted to shopping, gambling, pornography, video games, work, food, and there's others, but there's a whole list of things and they all follow very similar dynamics of addiction. But the reason why addiction complicates conflict resolution is that the offending person is very likely to keep doing the offensive behavior if they have an addiction. So this situation is hard on the other person in the relationship, of course, because they keep experiencing hurt repeatedly. So, um, but um, there's not as much time to talk about that today, but if you, you know, have any uh, questions about that, feel free to send me an email. Uh, I'm happy to respond to your, your question. My email is at the bottom of the um, bulletin handout there. So, and here we go, the last slide. So, our own cases, let's try to apply these principles to our own cases. So again, so that we can experience greater peace, closeness, and authenticity in our relationships. Let's pray together. 